Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, host of Jill on Money. On this episode, we're wondering what's stopping us from doing the best work of our lives. So in my firm, the way we've created a a boundary around this for now at our current scale is if we can staff an entire team of people who are passionate and ready to put their heart on the line for that client, then we'll take it. And if we can't find a whole team, then that's a signal that it's not it's not going to align with our values. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. This is the show where we try to provide some unconventional and often entertaining insights on your money and life. So today we've got a really interesting guest. His name is Aaron Dignan. Now, he is the mastermind behind this company called The Ready. And uh, what is it? This is an organization that is trying to help companies discover a better way of working. And, you know, frankly, I think it's pretty amazing if you look at how complex and uncertainty and, frankly, bureaucratic a lot of organizations are. It's kind of cool to have a guy and his company be out there to try to adapt to the new landscape. Aaron's also just completed a new book called Brave New Work. So here's our guest, Aaron Dignan. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Aaron, welcome to the program. We start every single show with an important question. You ready? Yes, let's do it. What is your best financial or career decision so far? It's funny. Every time I try to make a smart investment, it never works out as well as just starting a business myself. So you're good at starting businesses rather than choosing investments. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, that don't worry. You'll have some time to think about that because at the end of the show, we say what's your worst. So you'll think of like the superlative worst investment Perfect. you've made. All right. So what does your company do right now? So the Ready helps uh, organizations, particularly very large ones around the world, get away from bureaucracy, the kind of inhuman, hierarchical way of working that kind of drags it all out of us and move to something more adaptive and human. How do you do that in a big, nasty, I mean, I'm coming, we're broadcasting live from one of them, (laughs) CBS Corporation. How do you do that? It's interesting. The, of course, the, the mindset most of us have for change is that you go in from the top and you get some big dynamic leader and you tell everybody it's all going to be different now. And, and there's, um, you know, one grand gesture, one new org chart pushed out in PowerPoint and then it's done. Um, what we've learned through years of, of really trial and error, honestly, trying all the different ways to crack this nut is it's a lot about actually just inviting teams at every level to solve their own problems. So we, we actually go to teams and say, what's stopping you from doing the best work of your life? And when they tell us the answer, we say, great, what are you going to do about that? Do you have to get buy-in from the top to allow that to occur? You, you do. You need support at least within the domain where you're doing the, the work. So if it's inside a function or a P&L or a location, I mean, we've done factories, we've done you know all sorts of different places. Once you have a ring around that where the power holders say, okay, we're sick of the, the old way, let's try a new, then that's really all they have to do is make space, essentially. Let's say I have a friend who works at a large media corporation. (laughs) Sure, (laughs) a friend. Let's just say I have that friend. And that friend maybe works in this one division which pumps out content all the time, this Mm -hmm. news organization. Let's say that friend is me. Let's look at that as like a model. Here you walked into this building. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been here before? No, I haven't. What was your impression as you walked in? There's a lot of gray. There's a lot of hallways. Uh, that I didn't see a lot of people on my way back because they're all squirreled away. Do you get a, a, a sort of a first impression, like a, a hot take on an organization when you see the physical space? Yeah, because it's funny. One of the things I talk about in the book is that we all sort of live in this operating system, which is a set of assumptions and practices and principles that kind of make up culture. And of course, space is a huge decision in that operating system. So what does it look like? What does it feel like? Do people sit next to each other? Do different kinds of of roles and functions sit with each other? And so, yeah, when I walk into a place, um, I do get I do get a really quick sense of like, okay, okay, what's going on? Yeah, right. You get it. get like a little like a vibe. Yeah, I know. I do, too. So I was down in uh, some other media companies, (laughs) Yahoo (laughs) um, offices and. I mean, look, the place could be falling apart. I don't care. Verizon wrote a big check, and that's fine. But it is so nice to see people just open. Mm -hmm. It's bright. Mm -hmm. It felt collaborative. It could be baloney. I don't know. Maybe it is. But I'm just saying that the feel was so different, and it was so palpable, because I came from the CBS Broadcast Center, and I went there. Contrast. It was weird. 
I was asking them about, you know, how do you incorporate the video versus the written and how do you do this? And then it seemed a bit more collaborative. What happens if there are silos? So I'll give you like here we have CBS. We're broadcasting in the back of the radio division. Sure. But, you know, I do work in the television division. There's network. There's um, there's affiliates. How do you bring them together if they have all been traditionally siloed in the past. Yeah. Certainly the first way to do that is to start with an experiment. So we don't want to just, you know, tear up the sheet and try to do something at scale right away because that never works. I mean, something like 80% of all large change management fails. So that's that's a challenge. So we often start with an experiment and the experiment might be let's do something cross-functional to break the silo around this project or this venture or this vehicle and do that for a few months to see what do we learn, right? What what works, what doesn't work, what breaks what what rules, policies, boundaries, rhythms have to change to make that possible. Um, and if we get you know great success with that, then we can replicate it. There's one company that I studied in the book um, in China called Hire. They're the world's largest and fastest growing appliance manufacturer. They took 60,000 people who were working in silos, blew it up into 2,000 autonomous teams in a single year. And, oh my God! And completely right? took the like ripped the bandaid off and said, "All right, you're all now P and Ls. You right. all figured out for yourselves your customer service, your delivery. They had some central shared services to help them do it, but for the most part, you had literally thousands of teams running around trying to do their work. And what's amazing is it's totally successful. Like, you know what's amazing about that story also yeah. is that it's so counterintuitive to consider that a Chinese company, which yeah. is like the planned <laughs> society, right. has moved in this direction. Yeah. I think what's interesting about uh, what's happening globally with this sort of new ways of working phenomenon is that we're seeing it happen in almost every country. So almost everywhere you look, there's a huge um, what they call corporate liberation renaissance in France happening right now. Um, there's a lot going on, obviously, in the Scandinavian countries. China. Ha- the thing about China is there's a little bit of a pragmatism there. Like, does it work? Then we'll do it. So when you go into a business that is seeking your guidance, and then we're going to get to the book also because <laughs> why you read the book. But I'm just wondering, wh- where do you find the pressure point? Where does the pushback come from? I feel like there are two kinds of pushback, one more subtle and one more vocal. The vocal one is we don't have time. We're all so busy. We're back to back. It's one project to the next, one meeting to the next. I mean, I had a client that had 45 hours per week of meetings on average. Stop it. I know. I'm dead serious. And so there's a little bit of like, we can't make time to fix it. And, And I always go back to the old adage, you know, if I'd five minutes to cut down a tree, I'd spend three sharpening my ax. Mm. We want we don't spend any time sharpening the ax. So if the meeting isn't serving us, no one ever says, should we change this? Like, should we get rid of this Monday meeting or, t- or tweak it? Or what are we missing here? We just barrel through and we're mm-hmm. sort of taught to keep our heads down. So that's the first kind of resistance is everyone's really excited after the first, you know, TED talk and let's all go do it. And then, you know, week two, I'm like, all right, let's start our retrospective on Friday. Oh, well, we can't, you know, we can't oh, we make meetings. it. Yeah, exactly. We got to hit the quarter. So that's one which I understand and empathize with, but it's, it's critical. And then the more subtle one actually has to do with ego and identity. Oh, yeah. Tell so me about that. If I'm a leader, if I'm a founder, if I'm an executive and now you're telling me that the way to get what I want, which is resilience and speed and adaptivity and growth, is that I have to give up power. I have to share power and I have to distribute authority and I have to leave space and not be a hero. Who am I? Right. Mm-hmm. Why am I important? What is what is, happens to my identity and my purpose and my, my sense of self? And I have to trade one kind of control for another and one kind of power for another. And for some people, that gap, that bridge to sort of the new identity um, as space holder and as as kind of gardener rather than commander, um, that's a hard one. So it seems like you're very busy in your real life doing this. <laughs> For sure. Why did you write a book, you dumb dumb? In some ways, uh, because I'm yeah, because I'm an idiot doing this again. But I think the the thing about writing a book that's really helpful in this particular um, kind of movement is that uh, it scales. And so the a lot of time I spend with clients early on is just getting the mindset there, getting answers to the questions, talking about the cases, mm. getting them up to a, pl- a place of confidence that are the, and boldness and bravery that takes a long time. And my thought was like, wow, if I could put this down, if I could distill this into something that someone could do on a, in a, you know, a plane ride or two, then we could start from there, which is where the work begins rather than starting from, well, why should I do this? And so this is mean? like a pre-sale uh, marketing 
marketing tool, essentially. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like instead of them hiring you and paying uh, seven, high, high seven figures, maybe eight <laughs> figures if I'm arguing on your behalf. Why not? Instead of doing that, you say, you know, do me a favor. Read the book first. If you're still interested, come talk to me. But what about the rank and file? How can we, the small little people in these big <laughs> behemoth corporations, you write about this, what we can do on the ground level now? What constantly surprises me is we'll go into teams, particularly teams at the edge. I like to refer to it as the edge rather than the bottom. And I'll just ask them, you know, what's stopping you? What's holding you back? What are your tensions? We have a bunch of tools we use to help them generate those tensions. And then they'll outline them. And I'll say, great, which of these can you do something about? And the first reaction is none. But then as we peel back the onion, even for 15 minutes, it's like, oh, well, we can change the way we meet and we can change the way we communicate with each other and we could ask for this. And suddenly 80% of what's on the table, they're like, maybe we could chip away at that and start to move the needle. So part of it is just claiming your power mm. and, and taking responsibility for your way of working, right? I mean, there's a lot of control there, even within the constrained kind of workflow that we all have. What do you think the elements are to creating these independent teams that function within these large organizations. What are the characteristics that you have seen make them more successful? Yeah, well, I think at a principles level, it's really about three, right? Transparency is one. So really having a high flow of information. We all know what's going on. We all know what we're trying to do. We, we can see progress, you know, work in progress. There's not a lot of this kind of theater that goes on of like, I'm going to hide it and then I'm do the big presentation or you don't know what my division's doing because it's part of, you know, we're going to be successful and you're not. Hmm. So high transparency, um, high, high autonomy. So this idea that, you know, each of us can be the director of our own effort and can choose what we work on and can choose when we work on it and can choose where we work on it and all that kind of stuff, which is hard for uh, certain places to get on board with. And then the last one is really participation or consent is another way to say it. If you, if you talk to folks in the Netherlands where sociocracy, a, a way of working that really focuses on consent was born, the idea is just we don't all need to agree. We don't need consensus. We also don't need command and control. But what we do need is consent, meaning we all agree that this is how we're going to do this, or we're going to structure it this way, or this is the role, or this is how we're going to figure out who does this work. And so just by asking for consent, which is, that's safe to try. I may not love it. I may not even agree, but it's safe to try. Then we can kind of move forward. So autonomy, transparency, consent are really good places to start. Look, you run your own company, and you've run your own companies, sure. right? You're a serial entrepreneur. Sure. So talk about hierarchy, the good <laughs> and the bad of hierarchy, because here's something that's kind of intriguing to me. I ran a company for a while. I was the second in control. I really didn't run the company. I was just a high producer in sure. a company, and I had ownership. Yeah. So I didn't really want to manage. So clearly stated that I just did not like that role. <laughs> but there were times where the rank and file were unhappy mm. having to make the decision themselves. I'm sure. like, just figure it out. I don't, <laughs> don't bug me. And I felt like there were times I had to jump in because that's what they wanted. Was that a failure of not having the system that was in place to give them that autonomy? Or it was maybe it was a failure of my business partner who's a complete maniac? <laughs> um, it, it depends, right? So one of the things we do early on with teams when they're sort of rejiggering how they work is talk about decision rights. So where does a decision live? And there's a bad habit that we have of doing like a racy chart where it's like who's responsible and accountable and informed and consulted. And it gets very messy very fast. And it's impossible to hold in your head. So we just focus on where does the decision live? Does it live with an individual? Does it live with a role that's held by an individual? The way the president has an authority mm. but not the individual? Does it live in a team? And where, once we know where it lives, then we know how to make it. So some decisions are best made by a team, right? They need different perspectives. They need diversity of thought and opinion. And so we need a way to make decisions as a group that's fast and efficient and effective and safe. And then if it's owned by an individual, then maybe it's something that they can just decide on their own. Or maybe it's the kind of decision that, for example, at a company like Hire or Birdsorg or Fabi comes with an advice process. Mm -hmm. So you have the right to make the decision, but you have to seek the counsel of people that are going to be affected. Advice first. and consent. Exactly. Like right. So so that's that's one of the things that might have been unclear there is like, what, why are we freaked out about this decision? Maybe because we don't know where it lives. And if we don't know where it lives, we automatically assume that it lives at the top. Right. With the lunatic in charge. <laughs> okay. I think I passed my um, statute of limitations on everything. <laughs> sure. Anyway, when you go into different organizations, you go into mature, you go into tech, you go into international. 
Are there certain ones that are just harder than others for you? Because I, you know, listen, I come from financial services, the right. big, boring, old farts of the universe, right? Oh, yeah. Is that a harder environment for you to enter mm. as a change agent? It, it sort of yes and no. So we do a lot with financial services, actually. Um, but what's fascinating about it is they're the most in pain, but they're also the most constrained. So they, they actually call a lot and they have a desire and there's a need and there's a kind of a passion for figuring out better ways to do this. But at the same time, they're regulated or they're in a mm-hmm. high risk space. I mean, we've worked in, you know, aviation. We've worked in spaces in healthcare where it's like you can't screw up or something really bad can happen. What's challenging about those environments is that 1% of decisions that actually falls into that bucket becomes 100% when there's sort of a learned helplessness, right? Because the regulator said no to one thing, because we have to be compliant with 10 things, all things are not possible now. So it's easier to just say no to everything. Right. And it's easier to create a culture of risk aversion that sort of wraps around the handle. So yeah, in a way, those are some of the most challenging industries to work in. Not because it's not possible to do this work. Because there are cases like Burt's Organ Healthcare, right, that do really do it well. But the, the, the challenge is actually the mindset. It's the, it's the way people have become identified with that category and that regulation and that compliance that actually means we have an extra six months of work to do to get everybody sort of unwound. So if you have an organization like, let's say, Facebook, yeah, was it flawed to begin with that you have this one guy who has all the voting rights, who has really no accountability? I mean, is that just basically setting someone up to fail to some extent? Because no one can fire this dude. No one gets that. Like, you could be shamed, but there's no accountability. Is that a problem with a system design or is that just an individual weird company issue? Well, no, I think it's quite common now and actually being replicated. I think the problem is actually the intersection between the organizational OS at the Facebook level and the economic OS. Founders like that, one of the reasons that they try to hold that um, those you know sort of super voting rights is that they're afraid of the way the public market can really ruin a business. And, and the fact of the matter is that the public market has now gone from something where we would hold a stock for eight years in 1960 to an average of five days today. There's a lot of short-term trading. There's a lot of volatility trading. There's a lot of automated trading. People are hoping for rapid growth, quarterly outcomes, things that are not necessarily long-term goals. Right. So don't go public then. Screw you. Don't take the money. Well, and I think that's something that a lot of uh, startups are figuring out with things like NDVC and other funding sources is maybe we don't want to go public or maybe we go the route of, you know, Eric Reese is creating a long-term stock exchange where the longer you hold a stock, the more vote you have. Mm -hmm. I think if those mechanisms really were brought to scale, then organizations like Facebook would have a, a third option, right? Option A, is you have this super power holder. Option B is you go to a public market that's going to ultimately destabilize the vision and its greed for short-term outcomes. Sounds like, by the way, that the executive folks were pretty hand-in-hand with that greed factor, no? Possibly, yeah. I mean, it it certainly infects the mindset if you're already part of it, which they are, right? I mean, they're already part of that system. Okay, now talk about the third way. Yeah, the, the third way is that you have a more distributed ownership within the company, maybe not full cooperative, but you have a lot more employee ownership and a lot more steering and participation and consent. Right. And uh, you have um, a different funding source. You've gone public on a long term stock exchange. Maybe you're a public benefit corporation that can put purpose uh, ahead of profit when it makes sense. These are just little balancing factors that I think ultimately change the dynamic of, you know, this thing that sort of is addicted to its own growth and, uh, you know, and success into something that's a little bit more socially positive. So we are seeing organizations start to move in that direction. um, And it's, you know, it's promising. At the end of the day, the vast majority of the folks that I interact with and the people that I interview are really talking about growth at all costs. Sure. It doesn't feel market driven, although mm-hmm. I think that that's the accelerant. But, you know, the idea that, like, I'm going to I'm going to build this thing. And maybe Zuck, my dear friend. Right. Um, and yours, too. Uh, maybe in the beginning. Uh, yeah. Maybe he wanted to bring the world together. But I think it started because I just wanted to make fun of girls at Harvard. Sure. But let's say that. When he got to a certain point, he wanted to bring people together. But then you find out bad things are happening. Right. And then how do you help the people at that company? Like, what's, what, let's put you in the position of having to, to be the change agent at Facebook. Mm-hmm. What would you start with? Well, the first thing that I would want to do is actually trace some of the lines of things that have happened. So mm-hmm. do a little sense making. 
Like, how did this happen? How did that happen? Not from a finger pointing perspective, but from an understanding perspective. Because one of the things that I that I talk about in the book is the difference between a complicated system and a complex system. Complicated systems are things like watches and engines that can be predicted, understood, an expert can fix them. I certainly can't. But someone who understands a watch can be like, oh, this, this sprocket is broken, you need a new one. And they can make it work. So when you start to trace the line of what's broken in a complicated system, you look for what's to blame. You look for the broken part. You look for the thing that has the, the crack O-ring. in it. The O-ring. Exactly. Yeah, it's always the O-ring. Mm-hmm. Um, or the belt, if you have a car. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one mindset. Complex systems are systems like weather or gardens or children they are more unpredictable. They have so many interacting agents, so many things that can shape the dynamics of what might happen that you can't actually be sure. If you put six more cars on the 405 freeway in LA at 6 p.m., no computer on earth can tell you whether that's going to completely shut it down or they're going to be soaked right up, Hmm. right? Because the nature of the problem space, there's too much chaos in, in the system. And so complex systems need to be nurtured and interacted with and managed, and I I refer to it as kitten paws, because there's no way to know until you mess with it, and there's no way to trace it to any one single event. It's a it's a phenomenon that is emerging. So a big system, like let's say a company with a hundred thousand people or two billion users, is a complex system. And if we keep keep treating these systems as complicated, if we keep going like, what's to blame? Where's the broken part? Mm. What do we? How do we fix it? In a complicated system, you can solve a problem. In a complex system, you manage a problem. Nobody ever comes in from the garden and says, honey, I fixed the garden. Right. Right? It, that never happens. Right. You manage it. Right. You live with it. I pulled and some so, weeds and uh, yeah. I hope that, let's see what grows next. Yeah. And so there's, there's a really um, smart guy in the UK by the name of Dave Snowden who talks a lot about complexity. And one of the things he talks about is just doing controlled experiments where you basically irritate the system with a change and see what happens. And if you like the change that happens, you feed it. And if you don't like what happens, you starve it. Hmm. So you introduce something new and then you see if it gets better or worse. And so if I were at Facebook, I would, instead of doing A-B test to see how many people I can get to click on the birthday post, um, which they're doing you know, 10,000 times a day, I would start doing controlled parallel experiments on how do we get the outcomes that we want in terms of social engagement, in terms of citizenship, in terms of employee behavior, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. And actually looking at the things that are working a little bit, let's feed those things and let's accelerate those things. That sounds like a really fun job, actually. <laughs> I mean, I want to come work for you because essentially that is the the exploration part of this where you're not saying I want to fix this thing. But I re- I love that idea yeah. because it it almost makes me think about someone's personal finances where someone will call this show and right. they'll ask about this thing and they'll be like, should I buy or rent? <laughs> and that's not actually the issue, right? right. The issue is that, um, you know, your wife is pregnant. She's pressuring you to buy a house. You don't know how to tell her that we can't afford it. Right. Your parents are pissed because they think you're throwing money out the window. Like, you don't know how to manage all the noise and come to a smart conclusion or a decision-making path. Right. And so I think that that must be a fun part of your job, which is, I know it can be hard, but, like, to go in and, like, immerse yourself that must be totally cool. It's super fun, and but it also requires a, a weird kind of humility, right? Because you're basically saying, I don't know. I don't know how to fix Facebook. I know how to how to fix Facebook, right? right. Oh, well, like, you know the approach that would yeah. get you towards a better outcome. Yeah, exactly. And so you have to go in with that mindset of, yeah, I'm not sure if, if you should buy a house or not. And guess what? There might not be a right answer. So what we need to do instead is figure out what can we try that will give us more information, Mm. right? Like what's one move we could take in a direction that would let us know. So maybe we should go look at houses in our price point and see how that feels. Oh, we don't like those houses. Then maybe we're not ready. Now we have more information, right? Right. So it's always about like what's the next best safest move that we can make to move us in the direction of a future. Now, what makes you so good at this? Like what's your background? (laughs) Who are you, man? Yeah, that's a good question. My background is really just about following the most interesting question, right? So I came out of school where I was studying. Where'd you grow up? I uh, grew up in Colorado. That's why you're so nice. Is that why? Everyone from Colorado is so nice. Did you grow up in, in a, near a city or outside? I did, yeah, near near Denver. Mm. Um, went to school in Boulder, all that stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. you were a party boy then, huh? You know, I, I was actually not. I was kind of a nerd. You were a nerd at a party school. Yes. What's that like? It's isolating. Oh, poor you. <laughs> but I got a lot of reading done. So you went to college went to and then you graduated and what'd you do? I didn't graduate, actually. You I, blew out? Yeah. So I, I started uh, a company my senior year because I had spent the the last year reading about the psychology of brands and cults. Mm. So what makes us have irrational connections to 
systems, to communities, to, you know, to things that we, that we identify with, and got so obsessed with that and would so not shut up about it that people started to hire me to do little workshops around their brands and, and things that they were launching. Um, so I ended up starting a company that uh, my choices were go to finals or go to Coke headquarters. Um, so I went to Coca-Cola, <laughs> much to my parents' chagrin. Um, and, and yeah, now I'm, I'm three credits shy of a psychology degree. Dude, come on. you got to get the degree, though. I feel you, like you, now you I'm just waiting for hearts. the honorary. No, because that doesn't count. <laughs> just do, bang out three credits. It'll be fun for you. I'd rather do another book, honestly. It's that. Maybe that you should. Oh, my God. You're nuts. Okay. So you became like this marketing guru essentially, right? Yeah, spending time thinking about that. And what I noticed was, we were talking about brands. What I noticed were all the brands that were shaping culture were suddenly technology brands, mm. like Facebook or Google or mm. you know, fill, fill in the blank, Apple, et cetera. And I was like, wow, they are really levering on culture in ways both good and bad. I want to know more about that. So then I ended up co-founding a company with some friends that was focused on digital change. Mm-hmm. And so we started advising you know, huge companies like GE and American Express and the Gates Foundation on how disruptive technologies like big data or AI or robotics or, you know, 3D printing would change their world, would change the the way they do what they do or change the market that they operate in. So that was the question. That became really interesting. And then eight years into that, I was like, man, it's actually not about the technology at all. The reason these things are so confounding to us and confounding to large organizations is that we don't know how to change. We don't know how to adapt. What, what does adaptivity at scale look like? Does it happen? And so then I went on this walk about looking at biomimicry and complex adaptive systems like weather and traffic and all this other thing and started to find these organizations that were out in the wild, really fringy. No one, no one really spent a lot of time covering them. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, obscure like a tomato processor in California that is where people set their own salaries and write their own job descriptions, that kind of stuff. I like that. Um, and uh, and uh, who is 10x more profitable than their average, than their category average. And finding these companies and saying, oh my gosh, there is a better way to work and it metabolizes the technology, but it also metabolizes all this other change that we need to do social you know economical etc so then that became the thing and and then I started the ready and and started working on this book so it's just been like a lily pad from you know is that the bottom of the ice cream tub no there's another scoop and you know I, I feel like I've hit the bottom but we'll see what do you think about some of these consulting companies that have come under pressure you know, like the McKinsey gets the headlines, but I'm sure every single one of them has like these weird conflicts where they're asked to do like, sure. they're basically asked to do work for really bad actors. Oh, yeah. Right. So what is the role of saying no, whether you're a law firm or you're an investment house or you are a consultant? Because I feel like that sometimes gives a weird signal mm-hmm. to the staff of money always comes first. Yeah, what do we care about? Right. What's fascinating about this is it's back to decision rights, right? So who gets to decide if we work with big pharma or tobacco or firearms or fill in the blank or some foreign you know, nation that we're not super psyched about? You can answer that question however you want, but you need the consent of the group. So in my firm, the way we've created a, a boundary around this for now at our current scale is if we can staff an entire team of people who are passionate and ready to put their heart on the line for that client, then we'll take it. And if we can't find a whole team, then that's a signal that it's not it's oh. not going to align with our values. If we were 10,000 people, that might not be a good enough barrier. We might have to decide that we need the support of some percentage of the population inside or we need the consent of you know, a, a guidance board or who knows what, right? But the idea is figure out a way to answer that question, create a decision right around that, that everybody consents to, and then live with the consequences. How many people at the ready? I think there are about 30 right now around the world. What do you feel like is like the optimal amount of staff that you would feel good about managing as the boss? <laughs> Can well, Mark first, and I get a job? That's what I'm worried about. Yeah. First of all, uh, I try not to manage. Um, so we sort of take the role of leader, boss, manager. Who's we? The ready. All, all the all my partners. No, but I mean like so you are, what is your title? So I'm the founder, uh, but I don't have a title. We okay. have roles that we hold. So I hold a whole bunch of different roles, okay. including author. Okay. So we, we break the work up into roles. People hold combinations of roles, and they build a career path and a role mix. So mm-hmm. I'm going to take on this, jo- you know, this yep, job, yep, that yep. job, et cetera. And that's something that's done uh, with the consent of team members on each circle. Many roles are elected roles. The second thing is that everybody at the ready um, is a shareholder. So we're all partners in, in the entity. Not everybody has the same amount of shares. But, you know, we basically uh, award shares every year based on the contribution everybody makes. That's decided by everybody. So Mm -hmm. it's a sort of multivariant um, approach. 
you know, and everybody is essentially participating through that consent principle in in building the firm. So that's you know that's the way it operates. And, All right. Well, yeah. I, I like that. That's yeah. kind of interesting Pretty because yeah, I mean, the challenge is that as the founder, as things get bigger, you're then popped into roles that you may not want. Totally. And, and in fact, what you've you've solved for that already, which is we all have different roles. Yeah. And so I think that's really smart. We worked with um, with a nonprofit recently, actually, where the, the founder was saying, you know, th- all the things I have to do as CEO now that we've hit this certain scale are not all that appealing to me. I like to be the spokesperson and the, and the instigator yeah, the and visionary, the creative right? director and, yeah, the visionary. And so what I think I'm going to do is bring in a new CEO or a COO. But I think maybe that might be a bad idea. And why? And just like talk me out of it, basically. And, and? and my response was, yeah, you know, you, you run the risk of importing when, with a new leader some other operating system, some other way of thinking about how to run the business. And it's very common that people bring in that bureaucracy by trying to find that, you know, that replacement for those needs. I said, what if we just went to your leadership team, which is very capable and very strong, and just said, these are all the roles I hold right now. Which ones can you hold? Right, because <laughs> right? I and can't just do blow the roll up. I like that. And so that's exactly what we did. That's great. Yeah. So when you're looking at the the basic operating system of many of these organizations, besides going out and buying your book, what do you think are sort of the the questions to ask of yourselves, people in the company and mm-hmm. running organizations that might give you a clue as to whether you need a reboot of some sort? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting actually. We we've we published online the OS Canvas, the operating system canvas, and it's basically these 12 spaces, authority, information, structure, you know, et cetera. Um, and, and in each one, I think there's a set of questions you can ask, which are just, you know, what are our principles? What are our practices? And do they line up? Like, are they serving us? Mm-hmm. Essentially, it's as simple as that, right? When it comes to authority, what do we believe? Oh, we believe that people should be trusted, or we believe that people are, in, you know, inadequate, or whatever you think. And then what do we do? Here's how we handle it. And then how do we feel about that? Like, is it serving us? Is it not serving us? And not just how do I feel as the leader, but how does the team feel? How does their team feel? So it's as simple as asking that question. And and honestly, like I said in the beginning, the question I often open with is what's stopping you from doing the best work of your life? If you just go back to the office tomorrow and ask your team that question, they will have answers to it, Mm -hmm. no matter how good they are. Every team I interviewed, even the ones that were the most progressive, were working on something. And so just figure out what the answer is. Start working on it. Start experimenting with it. Okay, before we let you go, yes, your best financial or career decision, you said you're really good at starting companies. But you mentioned briefly that you were not very good at choosing investments. So what was your worst financial or career decision? I feel like I have passed on good investments uh, multiple times. So mm. um, maybe, uh, you know, having the opportunity to invest in, in a ride-sharing company or having the opportunity One, like, to maybe invest start in... start with a U or yeah, an or maybe a, or maybe a media company that posts uh, lists of very interesting things where I had an opportunity to be an advisor. So there, there are all these decisions where it was like, oh, I'm a little too busy to do that or I'm going to play hardball on that, what have you, and then you miss out. So I think one of the lessons I've learned is... If it seems interesting and, and it's safe to try, I'm going to go for it. And it sort of goes back to this idea of sure things and wild swings, right? For me, the business I started, the sure things where I feel like I have some agency. And then the other things should be, should be a little edgy. You have an opportunity to maybe say like, hey, I don't want to put you know a million dollars into this, right. but I'll give you my time. Are yeah, you interested? Absolutely. That's yeah. a good trade. Why not? I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks to our guest, Aaron Dignan. Don't forget, we drop new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. You can download this show anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Google Play, Radio.com, Stitcher, wherever. If you'd like to get on the air with us live, all you have to do is send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And if you have any questions during the week, you want to pop onto the website, just go to JillOnMoney.com. You can sign up for our free newsletter and you can get a copy of my book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is the executive producer extraordinaire. We're distributed by Cadence 13. See you next week.